Good. Uh, so good afternoon, everybody, um, and welcome to the SOAS Economics Summer Lecture Series. Uh, my name is Sara Stevano. I am a lecturer in the Department of Economics uh, here at SOAS, uh, and I'm also a co-organizer of this series uh, alongside uh, my colleague, uh, Tobias Franz. Um, it is my pleasure uh, to welcome you to the first lecture of uh, this mini series uh, that we have organized uh, for term three, which is our summer term. Um, so the purpose of this series is to um, present uh, some of the recent work that some of our colleagues uh, in the department uh, and also their collaborators uh, have been conducted in recent months uh, or years. Um, and of course, uh, we are all here today um, to uh, listen to Costas and Nicolas uh, talking about uh, MMT. Uh, but before introducing today's lecture and today's uh, speakers, uh, I would like uh, to draw your attention to the other two lectures uh, that are upcoming in our series. Uh, so as you can see, hopefully on the slide uh, that uh, on your screens, uh, uh, the next lecture will be on the 2nd of June. Um, with uh, our colleague Sophie van Hullen and uh, her uh, collaborator um, uh, Fuad Mohamed Abubakar. And the talk will uh, look at uh, why Ghana doesn't get the full value of its cocoa beans uh, and how this could change. So essentially this will be a talk on the financialization of uh, agri-food uh, chains, um, looking specifically at the case of cocoa. Um, and then at the uh, last lecture of the series so will be on the 16th of June, um, uh, with Mushra Khan, uh, who is a professor in our department, and he's been leading a larger project uh, on uh, um, uh, anti-corruption. Uh, the name of the project is ACE, and so he will be talking about uh, um, uh, this uh, work that uh, he has been doing with uh, uh, a large team. Um, so if you're interested, of course, uh, you're welcome to join us also for the uh, coming uh, lectures uh, and uh, we will share the details to, to uh, join on social media and uh, via our mailing lists. Um, okay, but coming back to us, so our first lecture is on a very popular topic, uh, which is modern monetary theory, also known as the MMT. Um, and we're really honored to have uh, Kostas Zapovitsas, uh, who is a professor of economics uh, here at SOAS, uh, um, and also Nicolas Aguila, uh, who is a researcher at the Centro Interdisciplinario para el Estudio de Políticas Públicas uh, in Buenos Aires. Um, they have been working, so Kostas and Nicolas have been working on uh, MMT um, already for some time. And for those of you who might uh, not know, I would like to draw your attention to uh, their work on this topic. Uh, so they have a paper published in the Japanese Political Economy Journal um, on a Marxist critique of MMT uh, with reference to Eurozone and Greece. And they also have, for those of you who don't have a lot of time to read long academic papers, a nice blog in developing economics uh, that provides a bit of a summary, a summary of their critique. Um, so today they will focus on uh, a bit of a new and different angle, which is uh, the current uh, US monetary policy. And this is part of a book they're working on, uh, on uh, uh, capitalism after COVID essentially. And so they might tell us something more about this in a moment. So before I hand over to them, um, what is going to happen next is as follows. So, so Costas and Nicolasso will talk for about uh, 45 minutes. Um, you can put uh, your questions and comments in the chat box uh, throughout, so even while they're talking, but also, of course, after they have finished to talk. Uh, I will collect the uh, questions and comments and put them back to the speakers uh, after their lecture. Um, and I would like to say, so this webinar is open to everybody. Um, and uh, this is how we want to do things in our department, so because uh, this is the ethos of uh, our work, uh, making uh, our work available to as many people as possible, especially now that uh, we are all uh, into this uh, um, online uh, uh, teaching and uh, researching and living mode. Um, but we're also aware that uh, MMT is a very popular topic at the moment, and people have uh, very strong views of uh, different nature. Um, so I would like to request uh, that everybody formulate uh, questions and comments in ways uh, that are clear, constructive and helpful. So I will be a very strict uh, chair uh, on, on this. 
Um, and on this note, I think without further ado, um, I'll uh, uh, hand over to uh, Nicolas. Thank you. Let me stop sharing my screen so that you can share yours. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Sarah, for, for the introduction and for the invitation. Uh, it is great to be here. And thank you, Tobias, too, for organizing this. Um, yeah, so uh, oh, can you all see my screen, right? Perfect. So um, as Sarah mentioned, uh, this presentation comes out of uh, a paper that we wrote uh, uh, a few months ago. Um, and there we try to, to contrast um, Marxism and, and MMT uh, regarding money. Um, first, it's important to say that, that we are part of the same um, heterodox approach uh, in opposition to the mainstream, broadly to the anti-quantity uh, tradition. Um, and we share a lot of the criticisms to the mainstream and also uh, a rejection of austerity policies. So really, um, our criticism aims to be uh, constructive and establish a, a point or, 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 a, or a bridge uh, for dialogue between the two traditions and does not seek to, uh, to destroy or, um, or classify them as, uh, as enemies or, or, or anything like that. Um, but it's still true that there are a substantial difference, differences in how uh, we understand money and how MD understands money. And these are worth um, presenting and contrasting and, and discussing. Um, and particularly, um, we focus on, on, on the ontology of money and on what is money for each tradition, uh, because we think that there is an overemphasis in many cases on, on economic policy, um, both by mainstream critics of MNT as well as by heterodox critics of MNT. And we think that. Uh, MMT policy conclusions are rather uh, a coherent result uh, of their uh, understanding of money. So tackling um, policy without really uh, discussing what, what is the underlying notion of money um, behind that, it's uh, a little bit superficial or, or, or not fully uh, fulfilling. So instead we try to to focus on, on the ontology of money, that is what is money uh, for us and for them then uh, we extend that to, to how we understand world money and monetary sovereignty compared to them. Then uh, the, the role of the state in the ontology of money and finally on, on economic policy. And in particular in this presentation, we will focus on, on US monetary policy and also fiscal policy um, during the last year. So I will start with the first two points and then I will um, leave the floor to Costas so he can complete the presentation. So on the ontology of money, um, MMT is, is also called neo-chartalism, and this is because they update uh, the chartalist theory of money, which was originally proposed uh, by Knapp and Ines um, more, than, um, more than a century ago. And they uh, also bring uh, insights from Keynes, from Minsky, and Ava Lerner, and, and, and other authors and they come up with this uh, neo-chartalist theory, which is also called uh, tax driven money or uh, money as a creature of state. Um, this comes out of a paper of, from uh, Ava Lerner, but I think that it would be more appropriate to call it uh, money as a creature of the law. And I think uh, many MMTers will, will agree with this. Um, so they depart by criticizing the mainstream. Um, we all know this story very well, so I will go very quickly. Um, the mainstream story is based on, on an allegedly um, society of barter that, that was supposed to exist at some, at, at some point. Um, but this society had a problem, the, the famous double coincidence of wants uh, problem, because if I produce, uh, let's say, bread and I want beer, then I will have to find a brewer uh, who's willing to trade his or her beer for my bread. Um, and that was inconvenient. So uh, rational agents uh, agree on using another commodity, a third commodity, which um, historically was different commodities, but in the end is uh, precious metals as uh, a means of exchange. So for the mainstream, money is, um, first of all, a means of exchange 
um, that results spontaneously from the market and is sort of a veil for what is it is uh, truly um, a barter economy. So uh, Chartalism says that um, this is not, not at all true, that this is a historical fiction, and, and we agree with that, we Marxists agree with that, it, uh, there wasn't any barter societies. Um, and Chartalism says that uh, instead, what used to happen was that um, individuals will transact and then they will just register their mutual obligations and eventually they will settle them uh, using their own commodities or, or, or other commodities. But uh, barter was not existent. And this is so much so that, um, that this sort of, the, or this form of organization uh, was not merely um, circumscribed to what we will now call uh, economic transactions, but it was broader than that. For example, it included what we will now call uh, legal obligations. One key example is the Bergil or Bergel, uh, which was a practice used by Sherpanic tribes in which um, they constituted an assembly that had the authority to settle um, mutual claims. For example, um, if I were to kill your brother, uh, then you will try to kill me back or kill my brother back. Um, and in order to avoid the escalation of conflict, an assembly will gather and will say, okay, I that kill your brother, I owe you something. And this assembly will um, impose a unit of account and they will impose uh, the amount that corresponds to that particular offense. For example, I kill your brother, now I owe you three cows. And this is in very that in that very same moment in which uh, the state authority is creating money. They, they are, uh, by imposing the unit of account, they are choosing the thing that will uh, become money. So money is not uh, a medium of exchange that arises spontaneously in the market, but it's rather a unit of account that is legally determined by the public authorities to, mutual, to measure uh, mutual debt obligations within a community. So in this, they, they follow Keynes and they understand that modern money uh, has been essentially the same for some 4,000 years at least. And this, um, this quote is what gives the name uh, MMT or modern monetary theory it comes from, from this uh, remark by, by Keynes. Um, so while this has been true for the last 4,000 years, they say that uh, that the specificity of modern nation states is that they impose a liability in the form of a tax obligation. So they have the power to tax um, all of us and they say what they will accept in payment uh, for those taxes. And by doing that, they are creating the unit of account um, that will become money. So in effect, they are forcing us to pay taxes in something that they choose and because of that, we have to uh, get our hands around uh, that, that thing that, that the state chooses. Um, and we later start using it uh, for other things that, such as a million exchange or, or sort of value. But first of all, money is again, a unit of account that is imposed by the state through taxation. So um, from a Marxist perspective, this is, um, this is not, um, not correct, um, mostly because it, um, it erases the specificity of, of money. Uh, believing that money has been the same for 4,000 years kind of uh, blur, blurs the, the historicity of money and of capitalism. Um, for, for Marxists, um, money is not at all something uh, trans-historical, but it's a properly capitalist thing. This is a thing that fully emerges on uh, under capitalist conditions. So Marx clearly acknowledged that uh, money emerged in, in pre-capitalist societies, but it is so uh, at the point of exchange between uh, societies and not as a result of the internal relationships proper um, to those societies. And this is the case because in those societies, um, the products of labor did not take the form of commodities. 
So um, there was some uh, planning mechanism operating behind it that um, makes every individual know what was his or her role in society and what he or she uh, will get in exchange for uh, his or her labor. For example, you were bound to a land and then you had to produce in that land and you will keep some of the output and then you will give the rest in taxes. And if you need other things that you don't produce, you will find a way to produce them or uh, we'll register them uh, as debts as, as we previously discussed. But in general, there was no uh, generalized uh, commodity exchange. For sure, there was a unit of account to uh, measure these mutual debts uh, that existed out there, but that unit of account cannot be properly considered as money. So money in those societies only existed properly um, at the point of exchange between, between them. And, um, and in capitalism, what happens is that uh, commodity exchange is generalized. It is the first society which functions under uh, the basis of generalized commodity exchange. In our society, there is no planning mechanism. So each of us um, produces whatever he or she wants. Uh, which doesn't have to be like a, a thing. It could be ourselves, our labor force. Um, for example, I decided to become an economist, but uh, I could have done something else. Um, and then in order to see whether the product of our work uh, is socially validated, we need to go into the market and sell uh, whatever it is that we produce. And, and then money plays a key role uh, because money is um, an object that has been assigned by society with the capacity to say whether um, our work is socially useful or not. So money plays uh, a really a role of articulating a society which is based on, on individual producers producing um, privately and, and without, um, without coordination. So money uh, for, for Marxism emerges first of all as uh, a universal equivalent allowing to exchange all the different uh, commodities and linking all the different uh, labors in our society and subordinated to that it plays the role of um, of measure of values of means of exchange and etc as um, as we all know but all of these functions uh, come into existence without needing uh, the state intervention or the intervention of any other uh, authority external uh, to the market. This is rather a, an endogenous product from the market in an interpretation that is totally different from um, the mainstream story. It does not rely at all on barter societies or anything like that. It just relies on an understanding of how capitalism is organized and how uh, labor has to be uh, coordinated. Um, so, Moving into the second point of the criticism, which is that of war money, um, our understanding of capitalism leads to conceptualizing capitalism as a global system. And as a global system, it requires world money uh, in order to allow the exchange of different products of labor in different parts uh, of the world. This um, presents some challenges for uh, chartalism as their understanding of money is based on the power of the state to uh, choose a unit of account through taxation. And then there is no uh, international or supranational state with the power to do that. Then it cannot be any world money. Money must necessarily be something um, national that remains at the uh, local realm. Um, and derived from that, monetary sovereignty cannot be anything else but a policy choice. And um, as they conceptualize monetary sovereignty is based on five points, uh, the national state choosing a unit of account, the national state imposing obligations in that unit of account, uh, the national government issuing currency and accepting it in payment, the national government issuing obligations, denominated and payable in that, and a flexible exchange rate. Um, and these are all policy choices. Um, and this is, a rather coherent uh, result from, from their understanding of money, uh, in my view. But for us, this is not at all the case. Um, monetary sovereignty is not at all uh, 
a choice, but rather um, the result of the hierarchical structure of the international monetary system that subordinates uh, certain countries. So you can fulfill all of those uh, requirements and still not be monetary sovereignty because you need to access warm money in order to import uh, means of consumption and means of production that you need um, in order to develop. So um, countries that are at the bottom of the monetary pyramid, they have a subordinated position in the uh, international financial system, and therefore they are not uh, monetary sovereignty. And this is a result of structural factors and not uh, of policy choices. Uh, Costas, would you like to take the floor now? Yes, please. But you'll have to help me with the um, with the slides, right? Because you've got commandable. Yeah. Um, okay. I want to, uh, in a sense, um, wrap up the theoretical part of the discussion of MMT, and then uh, give an example of um, U.S. monetary policy, for obvious reasons, um, which I will repeat when I come to it. Um, state economic policy, in some ways, is the main issue of contention uh, between MMT and its critics. Not so for Marxist theory, may I say. But when I read things like post Keynesians say about the MMT, for instance, or other critics, it always comes back to that. And that, to me, is a limitation. It is like saying the ontological argument doesn't matter. Let's discuss the things that are important, which is what would happen if the rate of interest goes up or goes down or whatever it is, up and down economics, you know. But this, that's not the case. I mean, that what you say about state economic policy depends on your view uh, about where money comes from and what it does and how it connects to the domestic e e economy and how it relates to the international economy, the world market, as Nico explained. So from this perspective, and given what has already been said by Nico so far, our point is this, for MMT, if we could sum up uh, policy as far as the MMT is concerned, basically the argument as we understand it is that um, um, taxes are not necessary um, for the state to finance its expenditure. Taxes are basically a way through which the state facilitates the circulation of money or fiat money. Uh, basically, for if the taxpayer is, is, is to be able to pay, um, the state, which is the monopoly issuer of money, must have provided the means of payment. And so the state must have engaged in expenditure prior to collecting taxes to allow the people to pay the taxes. So government, the logic of this is that government spending is not financially constrained either by tax or by debt. Um, government can always finance its deficits. Um, that is used as an argument for functional finance, which is an older argument, come, goes back to Abel Lerner, it doesn't come from MMT, but it's a, it's a sort of old, old style, a kind of Keynesian current, where basically, again, um, the argument is that fiscal policy doesn't suffer from financial constraint, but the real constraint. In other words, the availability of uh, spare resources. So as long as there are spare resources, there is no limit, uh, real limit to fiscal policy, and um, um, there will be no problem of um, inflation while spare resources are, uh, are available. Uh, the limit is inflation, if the resources become unavailable, and that's the, the true limitation of uh, fiscal deficits. So if, if output is below full employment, then there is no risk of inflation. The state can create money to bring about full employment. And that is the foundation of the job guarantee. Proposal, the most important proposal in terms of policy that uh, MMT has to make about the real economy as it were. In addition to that, and matching the job guarantee for MMT uh, macroeconomists, it's very, very important that the state determines the interest rate and parks it close to zero, basically. That, in a nutshell, is the understanding of our understanding of MMT fiscal policy analysis. And obviously, I repeat, the argument by MMT is not that um, the state can create money uh, without limits. 
uh, and there are no limitations to fiscal policy, it is that the limit is the availability of real resources. Uh, and until that is reached, the state can expand fiscal policy. In some ways, it's traditional. It sounds like traditional fiscal Keynesian policy because that's what it is. It is traditional Keynesian uh, uh, analytics. Now, for Marxist theory, on the other hand, monetary theory, but more broadly, um, government policy analysis, it is, of course, true that the state is not financially constrained in a way that is similar to a family or an enterprise. It is a false analogy. The MMT is right to say that uh, it's a false analogy to think of the state as a family or as an enterprise. Of course, the state is not that because often the state gets back what he has spent um, uh, in, in the first place. However, what the MMT ignores, and it's very, very important for Marxism, is that there is production and the state is not the producer. The state, uh, yes, boosts demand, but it, 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 demand is basically a claim on the output and the value produced by others. Uh, if we set aside nationalized uh, industries, um, the creation of value and output, however, follows its own internal logic. It isn't simply uh, due to the logic of uh, aggregate demand expanding and so on. And that logic of production is summed up by profits, by profitability. Uh, and investment based uh, on that. So if the state is to direct the economy, if we're gonna have guarantees about jobs and so on, the state must intervene on the supply side too. It's no good just intervening on the demand side um, from the uh, Marxist perspective. Now, having said this moreover, and as far as claiming output and value is concerned through states uh, intervening with the demand side, um, these claims take the form, obviously, of fiat money, which the MMT stresses, but they, it can also take the form of taxation and the form of borrowing. All three, from, from the Marxist perspective, are legitimate ways of um, claiming the output and value of others for the state with historical, historically different validity uh, and very, very different outcomes in terms of uh, their impact on production and on distribution. Privileging the creation of fiat money um, at the expense of taxation or borrowing is arbitrary. Um, taxation is a legitimate means of, uh, of, of state policy, um, at the very least for um, distributional purposes, but also in order to secure resources um, to, 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 to proceed to, with what the state uh, wants to do. The last thing we want to say on this, in terms of the analytics of it, all that's fine for developed countries, advanced countries. In developing countries, the MMT comes a cropper because the argument that the MMT can, the, the argument that developing countries can expand demand and meet, provide a job guarantee and do all this by creating fiat money. If you tell a developing economist this, I mean, you would get about 10 seconds of toleration uh, on this one. So. Uh, um, it's obvious that these arguments about fiscal and monetary policy need to be adjusted in terms of the hierarchy of currencies, in terms of the structures of the world market, and therefore in terms of um, uh, economic dependency uh, and power. Now, if you can just change it, Nico, please. We can talk about these things for a long time, but let's, let me discuss a little bit the empirical relevance here. Because the MMT, um, MMT theorists make quite a lot of um, uh, put quite a lot of emphasis on empirical arguments, though there's a lot of, there's a big debate that one can have about how they use empirical information. <laughs> In our paper, Nico and I um, looked at the Eurozone, and particularly the case of Greece. We did that because, well, some of us had personal, um, a personal experience through that. Uh, but also because it's interesting, and MMT also discussed it uh, at the time, and you can see the importance of it. Um, here is, an, here is a, a monetary event of profound significance for the trajectory of the European economy um, the last uh, 10 years and the possibilities of alternative um, policies, um, which had a certain ending. Now, I'm not going to repeat this here. All I will tell you is that while we were engaged with it, 
In other words, trying to implement different monetary policies in practice while we were engaged with it, but also afterwards, when we come to look at the experience uh, of Greece and assess what happened, the MMT is relevant. It might, not, it might as well not have, not have existed. I mean, and that was clear at the time. Uh, it didn't really, it's not, that, it's not that I or anybody else were against it. It just didn't matter. It, it, didn't, it didn't connect with what was happening uh, uh, in practice. And it didn't because the problems that were faced by a government that wanted to follow, follow different uh, policies then were problems of controls over banking redenomination of the currency and its costs, market uh, provision, pro pro uh, you know, supply provision, uh, and fundamentally a, a problem of class and international power relations. These are absent when you look at uh, MMT. It's it, it just, it, it just basically irrelevant. Um, that, be that as it may, what we're proposing to do now in the next 10 minutes is have a look at US monetary policy now. And we do that for two reasons. First of all, because what's been happening in the US the last year and actually longer than that is extraordinary. And a lot of people think it's a confirmation of MMT. Um, second, because we're writing a book on it, um, Nico and I and several other uh, researchers, some of them from SOAS, some of them broadly associated with SOAS, capitalism after COVID, and obviously the US experience is of paramount importance. So let's have a look at some of the monetary dimension of the US response to COVID the last uh, year or so. And let's consider it in light of the um, MMT arguments. So if you could just change the thing, Nico, please. The first point to, um, to make is, of course, that um, there is no doubt that the state controls the, the rate of interest. The MMT is right on this. Um, and there is no doubt that um, um, the Fed has acted as the driving force of short-term rates of interest, to be more precise. You can see what actually happened. And the way it happened is, is um, Interesting, I've summed up the uh, movement of uh, interest rates. You can see that um, the rate was brought sharply down and, um, uh, and it, within the, basically in March uh, of um, last year, and then it's been kept down and successfully down, very close to zero. So we've got the situation in which the Federal Reserve keeps the interest rate close to zero. Now, I wanna come back to that because it's an extraordinary phenomenon in the history of capitalism with all kinds of outcomes which uh, MMT doesn't seem to appreciate. So there is no doubt that the state can do that uh, and it has done it. Um, how, if you could just change the... Um, the way in which it has happened is of course through an enormous expansion of um, system open market account um, of the Fed. This is the latest um, evidence on it uh, from early March. And what you can see um, briefly, it's a snapshot, but you can see two things which are crucial for how the thing uh, occurred. The Fed drove short-term interest rates down by operating uh, through treasury bills, fundamentally, through the issue of treasury bills, so basically repo operations. Um, so they drove interest rates uh, down very quickly through that. What occurred afterwards, however, and it brings us to March 3rd, 2021, is of course not treasury bills, particularly that's not a striking thing. The Fed continued to operate through treasury bills, but that's not the striking thing. The striking thing is, of course, the issuing of notes and bonds by the US government and the acquisition of those and the acquisition of um, mortgage-backed securities. Um, th these two elements are the vast bulk of, um, of Fed assets. If you can just show us the next... This is what the um, Fed uh, balance sheet uh, looked like a little while ago. You can see the assets uh, at the top and uh, you can see the point I made to you about the expansion of um, treasury notes and uh, mortgage-backed securities. They're basically the two the 
dark blue and pale blue uh, elements. That's really what's what's done it. Um, and that has also driven affected long-term interest rates. The state then, in a way, has been able to operate on short-term interest rates and long-term interest rates. Now, long-term interest rates are a different story. Part of the reason why they've been able to do that is, of course, the availability of um, large volumes of private loanable capital um, in the markets. But that doesn't appear here. Uh, in terms of instruments, in terms of state intervention, what you see is uh, state acquisition here, provision of loanable capital by the uh, central bank. Um, the striking thing is, or there are two striking things about this. First, the emergence of this policy straight after the crisis of 2007-2009, and the um, tremendous increase of the policy in this crisis. It really is a turning moment. Um, uh, in, 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 in terms of where we are. It really is a, um, a development that, the likes of which we've never seen before. The, the Fed now commands seven and a half trillion um, dollars worth of assets, which are about a third of the US uh, GDP. There's never been a central bank this, that size before. And it's like a behemoth at the, at the heart of the US economy. Uh, in effect, the, the US financial system um, at, at the core of it, has been turned public. That's basically what, what this indicates. It is, it is not true that it, it, at the heart of it, in the money, in, in the money market, is, is, is effectively private. It's become, to a large extent, public. Um, the way in which it has become public is um, through the acquisition of these assets. And the, on the liability side, you, you see what's happening. Uh, bank reserves have increased, and uh, as have also notes and coins. If you could just show us the two. Um, here is the asset side, which is how I uh, summed it up for you. Um, and here is the liability side, um, just in this crisis. So the central bank has emerged as not only the monopoly, the monopolist of fiat money issue, which the uh, MMT stresses it is, but um, an absolutely dominant presence in the, in, in, in the financial system, that is not a permanent condition. That is a new condition. So one might consider this to be a confirmation of what MMT has been arguing. Well, it isn't because Marxist theory, Keynesian theory, monetary theory has always known that this can happen. It's not new. What is new is the historical context in which it's happening. And we've got to discuss the reasons for it. And to see the reasons for that, you need to see the next diagram, which shows you the US budget um, deficit, which really drives the point home. Um, the US budget deficit reached 15% of GDP um, in um, very soon in 2020. And that is, um, what has driven the um, expansion of the asset side um, of the central bank. If we go to the next piece of evidence, this shows you the, um, um, in a sense, the sources and uses reconciliation table of the, of the, of the US Treasury. It's the last uh, piece of information that they issued for February. You can see what the US Treasury has been doing in 2020. And it is obvious that the US Treasury has been borrowing enormously. You can see the increase in April, June, 2020 and not spending it. The, the, the Treasury has been sitting on huge surplus until early 2021. Um, the borrowing by the Treasury is obviously what created tight conditions in the money markets. I'll come to it. And the, and the, and the Federal Reserve intervened to keep interest rates down. Basically the Federal Reserve acts passively here to facilitate um, fiscal spending by um, the US government as is apparent. How that will pan out in 2021, we don't know yet. Note that the, the Biden administration will not spend money yet. There's still a, there's still a, a surplus. Um, how they will spend money and what this will do to the rate of interest, I will um, discuss in a minute. But if you just go to the next, so to sum it up, 
initial Fed intervention to lower interest rates in March 2020 through repo transactions. Stability pre prevailed afterwards, as I've shown. Budget deficit reaches 15%, which is about 3 trillion. Um, and it is the largest since the Second World War. Initially, it was properly funded through bills, but then through notes and bonds, as I've explained and I've shown you in the, um, uh, the balance sheets. Uh, that obviously exercised upward pressure on interest rates, and that was offset by um, system open market account purchases by the Federal Reserve. So at the moment, the, the Treasury still sits on a large surplus. What will happen, we don't know. But it is reasonable to expect upward pressure on interest rates again during the, obviously it happened during the first quarter of 2021 and during the second quarter. And part of the reason is, of course, inflation expectations as um, the as the uh, the central bank acquires these um, uh, these bonds why well have a look at the next um, the outcome of this is an enormous growth of, of the federal debt I mean the, it really is astounding the, the way the federal debt increased you can see from the perspective of the federal debt uh, the transformation of the policy of the central bank the transformation of the central bank itself. You, you can see it begins with the last crisis. Just as the balance sheet of the central bank was transformed after the crisis, so is um, federal debt. And you can see that in this crisis, it really went through the roof. Um, now, federal debt, the MMT will, will tell you, doesn't matter. That's one of the key arguments as I've explained. Well, not so fast. If you go to the next one. Uh, until 2019, the federal debt of the United States was roughly 40% uh, held abroad, 43% held by domestic institutions, and 17% by the Federal Reserve. This is the debt held um, outside federal institutions. I know the Federal Reserve is a federal institution, or at least uh, should be thought of that, but technically it doesn't um, uh, come into it. There is plenty of, there's another 25% of debt, which is held by formerly federal institutions in the United States. So this is the is the reference to the net outside the federal system debt. So 40% is held abroad, 43 by domestic institutions and 17 by federal reserve. The result of the policy of the last year is that the federal reserve holdings are 25% of um, debt. In other words, it's, it's direct monetization um, of, the, uh, um, of the expenditure uh, by the US government uh, this year. Is that without risks. Well, uh, if you think of um, the global situation, that's not the case. Um, uh, transformation, the, the increase in the debt and the transformation in its composition poses a risk for the dollar as world money. The functioning of the interest rate has already been negated as a key price. As I've explained, inter interest rates have been pushed down to zero. In effect, the, the money market doesn't work uh, in the way in which uh, you'd expect it to work uh, in a capitalist system. Um, the outcome is uh, facilitation of private credit expansion and bubble conditions. MMT has got very little to say on that. Um, but we saw what happened. Uh, precisely because of this, the growth of debt, driving of interest rates down to zero, the, the, um, the expansion of debt in the financial markets in the US and globally um, have gone on an incredible spree, um, which doesn't fit at all with the fundamentals. It's, it's basically um, driven by uh, monetary policy. And obviously, when debt is transformed in this way, other than the threat to the dollar, um, it substantially alters income and wealth distribution in the United States. It's not irrelevant that the debt has increased and it's held in this way. Not all debt is kept by the Federal Reserve. Large proportions of debt are held abroad and are held by domestic institutions. The United States must be able to keep domestic lenders ready to buy the debt and foreign lenders ready to buy the debt. The performance of the last year um, creates risks in this respect. So if we pursue it a little bit more, I'll just show you some of these outcomes. The growth of debt that I mentioned to you uh, during the last year is obvious. The debt of non-financial corporations increased tremendously during the last year. I mean, it's a real jump. It's unprecedented, actually, for uh, a short period of time. If you just 
Much of this has been through bank lending. Uh, and that's in contrast to the previous crisis. Uh, and in contrast to what has been happening up to the pandemic crisis, where banking bank debt has been increasing, but steadily, what happened in 2020 is an incredible um, jump. And obviously, uh, the, the counterpart to that is the counterpart to the Fed balance sheet. If you just show us the next, um, the jump in, in M3, which is the main measure of the money supply, um, which again, increased in an unprecedented way. Finally, last piece is of course what I just mentioned, financial markets, stock markets in particular, it's extraordinary. There's no other way to describe it. It's extraordinary, it's manufactured by monetary policy, it's manufactured by, fe by, by, by Federal Reserve um, policy whereby the collapse of March 2020 has turned into uh, a bubble to end all bubbles. Uh, during the last year, as you can see from the standard of poor, um, uh, behavior. Now, I want to finish by asking then, is uh, Biden's package the sign of an MMT <clears throat> era now? We went to the Biden era now, right? It isn't simply that, it's also <clears throat> even more of a fiscal expansion. Now, it's, it is too soon to assess what's happening in terms of uh, <clears throat> a system shift in the United States. It is possibly it is possibly the end of neoliberalism, possibly, but it would be too rushed to to to, to rush to, uh, to, uh, to to conclude that uh, right now. The question is, does it confirm MMT for us? That's that's the question now. Um, well, increased fiscal expenditure in a crisis and investing in uh, in infrastructure, partly monetized, is as old as the trees in capitalism. It, it's nothing new, right? Um, um, the real question here is um, the size of it. Right? That's really what makes a difference, the size of it and what it means for the central bank at the heart of the um, US economy. Now, MMT supporters are not very happy with uh, what's happening so far. They're critical. They seem to be arguing that um, Biden should be um, uh, spending more and faster. Um, and there's been debate within the Democratic Party. Um, but I can see two things which are of crucial importance. Biden doesn't say anything about the jobs guarantee, though he's got things to say, apparently, about the labor market. And obviously, Biden is talking about increasing taxes, um, which is not an MMT thing. So, um, so in both these respects, this isn't really an MMT moment per se. This is a moment whereby um, the most important government in the world has shown that it can use fiat money freely when the chips are down and he has learned how to do it. It's a learning process. They learned how to do it in the last crisis and this time they've done it in spades. So the last question is, is this policy sustainable? And here you need a little bit of Marxism for that um, or a big bit of Marxism. Um, well, formally it is. Yeah, formally it is sustainable for a period. Just sip this because getting paid. Um, formally, it is um, uh, sustainable for a period, but obviously what has happened so far, certainly from the demand side and the money side, does not resolve the structural problems facing uh, US capitalism and creates new tensions, which uh, I've indicated. So far, it is financialization based primarily on state debt rather than private debt. That's basically uh, another way uh, of looking at it. We've got permanently low interest rates, which have boosted asset speculation and a bubble. And there is a dis there's a disconnect between stock markets uh, and a contraction of GDP. Um, stock markets going through a bubble and the contraction of GDP, which is without precedent. Um, we think that in practice taxation will be vital in the period ahead if this policy is to be maintained or if policy similar to that are to be maintained, taxation will be vital in the period ahead. Um, something will probably have to be done about the stability of uh, financial markets. There will be, there will be a, an adjustment. How violent it will be, it's difficult to tell, but there will be an adjustment. Uh, and the real issue, which MMT doesn't have very much to say, is what will happen on the side of supply. What's interesting about Biden is that there are some sounds and noises that the US elite is beginning seriously to think about intervening on the supply side. 
uh, through um, changing the infrastructure of the country and uh, uh, and other measures, possibly in relation to the uh, labor market. Uh, nothing particularly radical has been heard yet. This isn't Roosevelt, it isn't the 30s. Um, there is no talk of nationalizing parts of production uh, and intervening in that, in, in that way, nor is there any talk of uh, dramatically changing uh, labor rights. Um, but that is where the critical, uh, that, that's the critical issue. And on that, the MMT doesn't have much to say, I'm sorry to say. Um, thank you very much, that's it. Um, and we'll look forward to discussion. Thank you very much, Nicolas and Costas, uh, for a fascinating and rich talk. Um, so there are already some questions in uh, the chat box. Uh, so if okay with you, uh, perhaps I'm going to put a couple of them to you uh, and I'll give you the chance to respond and then we'll go to the next round. So there is a question from uh, uh, Louis. Uh, who says, uh, um, you state that from a Marxist perspective, money is not a creation of the state, but arises spontaneously out of the dynamics of market capitalism. However, you stress uh, that we should not understand uh, these uh, uh, as uh, similar to the traditional account of the origin of money as a solution to the problem of double coincidence uh, within a barter economy. Could you elaborate how the Marxist theory of the origin of money differs from that traditional account? So a question on the initial part on how we can theorize money from different perspectives. And then uh, there are a couple of questions from Agilos, uh, who says, many thanks for your presentation. Uh, do you believe that the era of low interest and low inflation in the US of the last decade will be a thing of the past? Secondly, do you think Biden's package poses a good natural experiment to disprove uh, MMT if inflation rises uh, in the near to medium future? So perhaps we can start uh, with these questions and then we can move uh, to the following one. Any of you who wants to start, uh, Nicolas or Costas? Uh, maybe Nico can start and... Nico, go ahead, please. Yeah, um, I will start with the first uh, because I didn't fully uh, hear the, the other two, but then uh, I will read them and, and, and reply after um, Costas. So the first question is basically about the difference between uh, the mainstream approach and, and Marxism. And there are actually many differences. Uh, perhaps the most important one is that uh, the mainstream does not have a theory of value. Uh, it's just a theory of prices. So for us, money, um, is a way in which uh, value is expressed. So that's a fundamental difference. While for, um, for the mainstream, it's just a medium of exchange um, that is available to uh, an otherwise barter economy. Uh, for Marxism, monetary relationships are at the very core of what capitalism is and cannot be uh, thought just as a mere veil or uh, something like that. Um, because of that, uh, our basically, the the mainstream uh, theory of money is just um, a theory of the functions of money or the roles of money. They do not really have a theory of what money is. Uh, when you ask one mainstream economist what money is, they will reply to you, it's a medium of exchange, a store of value, and a unit of account. Um, and that is basically the functions of money, but it, that is not what money is. Um, unlike that, Marxism does have an answer to what money is, um, which is what I previously discussed, the way in which uh, capitalism um, organizes and, and links together different uh, parts of labor. Um, if I can add something to that, there is um, there is a very um, extensive literature on where money comes from within the Marxist tradition. In fact, Marx, Marx proclaimed for himself that he was the first political economist to answer the riddle of money, okay? Uh, in other words, where does he come from? Um, so there's a long debate on that. What makes Marx and the Marxist discussion different is that um, the account that he gives and the debates they have followed have to do with what he calls the development of the form of value. Um, 
as opposed to the substance of value, right? The form of value and how that happens. It's a, it's a, it's a deeply philosophical debate. He draws extensively on Aristotle. Um, he acknowledges that indirectly, but he draws more on Aristotle than he acknowledges, actually. Uh, but it's, uh, so it's, uh, it's a deeply philosophical um, debate and he has to do with the, in a sense, the evolution from within of, um, of, of the form of money when commodities begin to interact with, with each other. What does one retain from this? That when you get commodities interacting with one another, you're gonna get money. You're gonna get money spontaneously emerging through the interaction, not because of the solution uh, offered by state, or an outside force, but because of the spontaneous interaction of commodities, it's actually a remarkable thing what he tries to do and what he does. And there's no, there is no, there is no um, similar uh, analysis anywhere in the corpus of economic theory. Um, various complex problems arise there, including Russell's paradox, for instance, um, of money emanating spontaneously among, um, from within a set of essentially equivalent commodities. But that's how he does it, and. The key thing is here is that commodities come before money and commodities create money. I say this because a lot of people get very confused about that. Yeah, when you get money, you get commodities. No, no, no. You get money because you get commodities, because you have commodities. Okay, that's that's fundamental to how Marx does it. And then you have commodities, you have money. If when that when that situation arises, the state can intervene and can do certain things with money. The state is very important, but it assumes that money. Uh, exists in the first place. That fits very well with the historical record. Never mind what the NMT asserts and so on. It fits very well with the historical um, record. Now, not much about the theory, the, the deep ontological stuff. Now, the questions that were asked by Angelus on um, current policy are, are also very, are of course, very important. And obviously we're gonna move into a discussion of US policy per se. Um, the real question is, are we gonna get inflation? That's basically the, the real question. Um, because we know that the state can maintain interest rates down to a very low level. And we know that when this happens, we don't necessarily get inflation in all instances. Uh, look at Japan, right? The Japanese have parked interest rates very, very low for, for decades. You don't get inflation. In fact, what you, you get is a pronounced inability uh, to have inflation. It's got nothing to do with MMT, right? It's got to do with how um, money works. The real question is, are we going to get inflation in the US? And will interest rates remain low? The state can keep interest rates low for a period. It can do that. Um, will there be inflation? The US is not Japan. And that's why we mentioned what we did about world money. Right, the U.S. is not Japan. There are different, different um, factors impinging on U.S. monetary policy that have to do with its own debt. Who holds its debt, uh, and how does U.S. debt operates um, uh, globally, and therefore affects the dollar? Okay, so that it is connected to the ontology of money. It isn't. Uh, um, it is not beyond the bounds of probability that there will be inflation. At the moment, there are no serious signs, although already, as I've indicated, markets are beginning to push interest rates up in the few, few months of 2021 because of the fear of inflation. Um, it, it is not beyond the bounds of probability. It is too easy, it would be too glib to, um, to assert that this won't happen. And one easy way of looking at it and establishing why that might, might be, is of course to look at the supply side. You can think about it as a Keynesian, not as a Marxist in this case. Look at the supply side. Um, demand has been boosted enormously, partly monetized. Will the supply respond? Will the supply side respond? There is no guarantee. We showed you evidence of increased indebtedness by US corporations. That means survival of zombies. That's basically what it means. The, 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 the increase in debts, the corporate debts that we showed you before, basically hide huge numbers of zombies that have been allowed to, to survive because of that, together with the financial explosion in the stock markets. There is no guarantee that the, su the supply side will be able to respond. Um, there is no certainty that there will be private investment increasing and output increasing, meeting the, the, the boost in demand. We will see in practice. Um, if that happens, then yeah, we will get the reversal of policy. The US is not Japan. Uh, we will get a reversal policy and uh, we will get a, a new set of um, uh, conditions to, 
to tackle. But it's still too soon to say. Biden seems to have all kinds of aces up his sleeve. So we'll have to wait and see what other things he reveals. I hope I'm answering you. Thank you, Faustas. Uh, Nico, if in the meantime you have the time to, cut up, to catch up with these questions and you want to add something, please do. Uh, yeah, just a few quick points. Um, one is that um, since the global financial crisis, we've been seeing uh, a decade of really low uh, growth. And, and truly, uh, the global economy was in a deeply um, complicated state even before uh, the pandemic struck. So um, what will happen with uh, inflation and interest rates and any other variables um, really will depend on um, if there is a sort of um, a change in supply or, or a more uh, radical departure for the model that was prevailing uh, before Corona or not. Um, so if your policy is just um, giving money to zombie firms, then you will only um, push the moment of recognition into the future. Uh, but if there are bolder policies that seek to go into uh, a green transition or um, to revitalize the care economy or, 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 or develop productivity and, and, and which was really, uh, the growth of productivity was really low um, during the last decade, then we might see something different. But if not, yes, it's probably that, it's probable that at some point um, inflation will reemerge because like you are just keeping things as usual with uh, more money on top. Um, on, on your other question on where this uh, is a natural experiment that could this proven be, um, I don't think so, uh, basically because as we argued, um, Biden's package is not fully uh, MNP. Um, so if it, it, it goes wrong, um, it cannot be attributed to MNP. Um, and also because uh, even if the package ends up in inflation, which I doubt, um, or at least for, for some time, um, it will not disprove MMT either. MMT does not say that, um, that you can print money and there will be no inflation and, and, and that's it. They say that there is a limit with the real availability of resources and then at that point there will be inflation. So um, at most what it can do is say that uh, MMT's estimation of the difference between um, real output and potential output or, or however you want to call them, uh, was closer than what they thought it was, and there was less room for uh, for policy, but not more than that, really. Thank you very uh, much, Nick. Ah, sorry, Francis, yes. I, just say, I mean, can I just say something, Sarah? I saw a question. I'm going to put all of them to you. <laughs> he, you're ruthless, right. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can do it. So if you yeah. it's okay, like okay. about, no, no, yeah. I mean, if I can, I mean, you can put them to me. I just want to take that last one that I can see on the theory okay. of credit because I think it's an important question, which okay. basically says, if you, for those who can't see it, that endogenous theories of credit, but um, uh, what's a theory of credit from Marx's perspective? Marx seems to have a history, not a theory of credit. Well. Uh, right. Actually, the question is very, very important because it goes to the heart of a fundamental distinction in monetary theory between credit theories of money and monetary theories of credit. MMT is a credit theory of money, as we've explained. Essentially, it tells you that money is based on some form of credit or, or some, sort of, some sort of promise, some sort of... Uh, external obligation and relationship, which might be more commercial or not, right? So it's a credit theory of money. And MMTs are proud of that and they think it's novel. It's not novel. It goes back centuries, okay? So that's a credit theory of money. Schumpeter had one of them, for instance. Okay, and so did others before that. The Marxian tradition, the way we've explained it, you can sum up as a monetary theory of credit. In other words, First comes money, then comes credit. Not the other way around, as MMT would have it. First come credit relations, then you get money. So first comes money for the Marxist tradition. Money is a more fundamental category. Credit comes afterwards. So there is a theory of credit. There's a very um, deep and uh, rich theory of credit 
in the Marxian uh, over and the Marxian tradition. And actually, it's a theory of credit that structures credit um, and differentiates between forms of credit and considers their impact uh, on accumulation um, very complexly. Uh, and differentiates between credit, for instance, that arises among businesses, in other words, trade credit, which MMT ignores, but it's fundamental, particularly in developing countries, right? In the first instance, credit is trade credit in developing countries, but also in, in, in developed countries. And then monetary or banking credit, which is, of course, the lending of money. It is for this reason that I said that interest rates at zero negate the function of the credit system. From a Marxian perspective, the credit system is a definite structure. It emanates from accumulation. It acquires banking forms. Why you get banks is a complex question which we don't have to discuss now. Um, and then you have money markets. In other words, key markets in which banks trade with each other. That's the pivotal market of, of, of the credit system. The money market, which of course the MMT doesn't particularly discuss. Um, then you get other markets, right, of credit. The money market is where trading must take place fairly freely if the thing is to function in ways that um, would be compatible with free market capitalism. That's precisely what's not happening and hasn't been happening in the last decade. The money market, in other words, the market between banks, fundamental interbank market, partly, but also big operators market is dominated by the central bank. That's basically what it is at the moment. The central bank is sucked in the, um, the money market and drives the rate of interest down to zero, right? That's how it's done it, the, the short-term rate of interest. Um, but when that happens, interbank transactions um, are basically deformed. It's a deformation. And you can get that, you can see the implications of that in terms of where pension funds work. So how all other institutions work when, when, when interest rates go down to zero. I'm not advocating high interest rates, please don't misunderstand me, but you've got to, you've got to appreciate what's happening around you. Um, so there is a theory of credit, a profound theory of credit by Marx, and actually tells you what's happening right now and where the structural problems uh, might be. As long as the state maintains the um, central bank to this size and dominates the money market in the way in which it does, you're not going to get properly functioning, uh, a properly functioning credit system. And what you're going to get is bubbles, zombies, uh, and the survival of banks on the back of uh, public funding. That is connected um, to the theory of credit um, that uh, I've outlined. Thanks, Costas. Nico, would you like to add anything on this uh, question posed by uh, Sal, the last one in the chat box? Yeah, maybe uh, shortly. Um, so I don't think that Marx doesn't have a theory of credit, just a history of credit. Uh, if you look at volume three, there is an extensive discussion on, on credit, which uh, he didn't finish, but uh, there is a long Marxian tradition that uh, elaborates on that. Um, and as Costas mentioned, um, the important point is what do you consider um, money and what do you consider credit? So credit theories of money think that everything is credit, um, while for, for, for money theories of credit, um, there is still an absolute anchor. So if credit is a promise, it is a promise of what? It is a promise to pay money. And if you have a great theory of, uh, of money, then uh, you can never answer um, what is the absolute uh, anchor beyond uh, structuring all those process promises around that. Uh, MMT has an answer, for example, which is uh, the anchor is um, the state's uh, capacity to tax. So um, because of that, uh, the state sits, the um, liabilities of the state sit at, at the top of the pyramid. Um, but for us, um, even uh, currencies, which uh, for Marxist theory or, or for some strands of Marxist theory that uh, I agree with, uh, cur national currencies are a form of credit money, not uh, money. Um, they are still promises to pay money. So um, I would say that. And, and then of course, yes, there is like a structural uh, relationship between different promises with different um, acceptability because they have different capacities to fulfill their promise. So at the very bottom, you have 
promises made by enterprises, then bank credit, money market credit, and finally, national currencies, which are a form of central bank credit. Um, so that uh, structural, that, that is a structural theory of credit, which is um, the Marxist theory of credit. Thank you, Nico. So I'd like to go back to a question that was put earlier by Netson, uh, which uh, I think is quite important it's from developing countries. And I'm sure I'm biased because I work in the global south myself. So, but Netson says, I do understand the critique where, um, whereby MMT is said to not consider international power relations. However, MMTers like Dongo Sambastilla have written on the use of MMT in developing countries. So, Basically, MMT is a framework of understanding where monetary sovereignty can be viewed on a sort of spectrum. In this sense, they do recognize that monetary sovereignty is not necessarily a policy choice, which is your critique. So would, you, uh, would this understanding of, uh, sovereignty, of, the sovereignty, uh, of sovereignty sorry, question the validity of your critique, or is it merely superficial because it does not explicitly consider power dynamics? I know Dongo quite well. I work with him. I respect his work um, and everything he's done, particularly in relation to um, the role of the French franc in um, West Africa and the modes of exploitation through the uh, monetary union operated on the basis of the French franc. Um, It's a fair attempt, and it's basically a Marxist attempt. It's actually to Marxize MMT. It is to it is to interpret sovereignty as a range, as a as a as a spectrum. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you if you're saying that, then we could begin to agree, because obviously, for from a Marxist perspective, when you look at the at, at the world market, yeah, there is a spectrum of, of sovereignty. Because of course, for us, there's a hierarchy, and uh, and the spectrum is interrelated. In, in the sense that the hegemonic power is more sovereign than other powers precisely because it's a hegemonic power. In other words, in other words, lack of lack of sovereignty for some countries is the necessary outcome of sovereignty for others. Okay, so so there is there is a range of uh, sovereignty indeed, and there is a range of uh, power that can be exercised. Uh, of a monetary affairs, depending on a variety of things, which have got nothing to do with uh, narrow monetary things, right? Narrow monetary issues that, that derives from the position of a country in the world division of labor, from the structure of its economy, the structure of its exports and imports, uh, its role in the capital markets, and so on. Um, if MMT goes down that path, then we can begin to communicate even more fully internationally. But that's not how the MMT began. That's not what MMT, how MMT became known. That's not how MMT. Um, made this case and it became globally um, uh, known and influential. Um, that is a recent development, and it's a recognition of the weakness, recognition of the of the lacuna, of the gap. You know, so it's it's a good development. Long may go down that way, and then we can begin to communicate because they will be moving closer to um, to the reality of world markets. Yeah, um, I totally agree with that. I, I think that it is great that. Uh, um, MMTRs are dealing seriously with uh, the problems of developing countries, um, and they are doing some interesting work. Um, what I would say is that um, both um, Ndongo and also Fadel Kabuk, who also works with developing countries, they accept this definition of, of uh, monetary sovereignty. They don't negate it. It's, uh, it is still for them a policy choice. Um, they accept the, the bulk of uh, um, and neo chartalism as and other uh, things that are part of the MMT package, such as uh, sectorial balances approach or the functional finance. Um, they accept the whole of that as uh, a framing. And then um, they also accept the definition of monetary so sovereignty, which it is, it is um, totally consistent and, and a consequence of, of, of the neo chartalist approach. What they do say is that. Um, what developing countries should do is to gain monetary sovereignty. The fact that they define it as a spectrum um, does not negate that it is a choice. It is still a choice. And how they can achieve that? Well, by uh, stop 
um, borrowing in foreign currency, uh, stop engaging with uh, the IMF or other uh, international organisms. And instead, what they should start to do is mobilize their own resources to uh, produce the food they need, to produce the technology they need, um, to produce the energy they need. I think Father Kau has this uh, notion of sovereignty, energetic sovereignty, food sovereignty, and, and industrial or uh, technological sovereignty, um, which is good uh, as far as it goes. But I think that um, misses um, decades of discussion in developing countries and, and the history of attempts to do that, for example, ISI. Uh, so I'm from Latin America, so I, um, I know very well the discussions that uh, structuralists and dependency theorists had around that and whether it was possible or not. Um, and to merely just say that um, states in developing countries can mobilize their own resources without any problem, uh, it's a bit um, simplistic in my view and, and doesn't really engage with uh, theories coming from uh, from these areas. So nevertheless, I think that it's great that they are uh, starting to deal with these issues and probably as, as they go on, they will start um, moving forward in, in, in these criticisms that, uh, that we made and, and yeah, we can dialogue as, as Costa said. Very interesting, thank you. So there was another question on US inflation by Basit, but I think Basit has left the meeting. So I'm going to move to the question put by Michael. Um, who, which is again on theory. So Michael says, could you uh, more explicitly draw out the links between the ontology of money and the policy conclusions uh, in respect of the US? Uh, it seems to me that the critique of MMT rests uh, more on a Marxist analysis of production versus exchange rather than the ontology of money. Okay, now we're gonna go into deep waters. Um, very, very important part of Marxist theory of money is the evolution of the form of money. The form of money is very important. In other words, is the money a commodity? Is the money is money use a commodity? Is it some form of banknotes? Is it some form of bank accounts? Is it some form of um, central bank liability? What is it? For Marxist theory, these different types of money operate differently. They are not the same. It is actually misleading simply to group them into the category of money. Obviously, they're all forms of money, but um, how they behave and how they relate uh, to accumulation depends on the form because the form results from different economic relations, okay? Commodity money is a very simple, original, ancient form of money. Bank money, credit money, is the result of basically capitalistic relations um, that place banks at the heart of commerce and uh, production. Uh, state issued credit money, modern, basically high powered money, is credit money of a kind. It's created by a bank, but that bank is public. It's a public bank. It has the backing of the state. It doesn't operate commercially. It's not driven by the profit motive. It's driven by planning. It plans the economy, and that's how it creates its liabilities. And he has the, the imprimatur of the state behind it. So he has elements of fiat. So it is a kind of fiat money, but it isn't fiat money in the way in which the French state created fiat money 200 years ago when they had a printing machine and started putting banknotes out. That's not how it works. That kind of fiat money and US contemporary fiat money work very differently. Okay, work very differently. So the ontology of money is related to what's happening now, but in this long and um, involved mediated way, you mustn't expect to find a direct immediate connection between the derivation of money through commodity interactions and what's happening in the US market today. The forms of the US market today, the forms of money that we see today are highly evolved, uh, credit-based fiat forms of money. That's why for us, we can communicate with MMT. The MMT see this, they recognize this and that's how they discuss it. They, they discuss the functioning of it, but they immediately think that all money is like that. All money is the creation of the state. No, no. What you see today is, the, is the, 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 the outcome of a long historical evolution which corresponds with the evolution of capitalism. The capitalism today has got very little to do with the capitalism 250 years ago. 
in terms of its institutions, its large corporations, the way it works globally um, and domestically. So in that context, you've got to be thinking of contemporary money as state-issued fiat money, st or rather state-backed fiat money with credit characteristics created by the central bank, the money that I showed you before, all right? Four and a half trillion of it uh, on one count on the, on the um, balance sheet of the Federal Reserve. And then privately created credit money by private banks, um, which is connected to this fiat money. The key point here for Marx's theory is whether this money is convertible into anything else in an obligatory way. The key transformation uh, historically is that this kind of money has stopped being convertible into anything of value necessarily. That's really the, the big change. It's a change that has characterized capitalism in the 20th century. It's a change that began by the state. The state intervened in the sphere of money. It made money inconvertible into anything of value, produced value. Uh, and therefore, uh, it freed, it gave degrees of freedom to the central bank in operating, uh, in operating fiat money. Um, the characteristic feature of the last 40 years since Bretton Woods is that the ruling elites of the leading countries, the advanced countries have learned how to do that, how to operate that. They didn't know it in the beginning. You got inflation in the 70s, dramatic inflation in the 70s. Volcker emerged and suppressed it. They've learned how to control it. And what's astonishing in the last 10 years, that's the um, balance sheet I showed you. They've also learned how to expand the balance sheet um, uh, without precedent. It's an experiment. It still is an experiment. We don't know what the final outcome will be, um, um, but, but it's happening. It's happening under, in front of our own eyes. Um, that's how the world moves, right? Uh, so in terms of the question, uh, the ontology of money is of paramount importance, but it's mediated. Don't expect to find a direct link with the original argument about where money comes from. Nico, would you like to come in? Yeah, just very shortly. Um, so I fully agree with what uh, Costa said. Um, so we try to show how um, MT uh, policy conclusions came from uh, its ontology of money. Basically, the idea that um, the, the money comes um, is issued by the state when, when the state is spent, and then um, nor taxing nor um, uh, issuing debt is a mechanism of state financing, but rather uh, uh, a way to destroy money. And really, the state brings money into existence, and then it has the ability to create more money to command uh, real resources until they um, they are they are fully used, um, and then it can tax or whatnot to, to destroy money. Um, so we try to show that this uh, ontological understanding of money has, has its problems, and because of that, uh, the policy conclusions uh, as well. Um, but there is no straight line from our ontology of money to uh, policy conclusions, mainly uh, for two things. First, uh, because um, as many Marxists said, uh, you need concrete analysis of um, the historical concrete situations in order to draw that. And second, because to do that, you really need the whole um, understanding of contemporary capitalism that comes after. Um, so you cannot derive policy conclusion from chapter three of volume one, you read, you need uh, the three volumes and, and much more um, in order to do it. Um, but um, as Costa said, that, that requires to understand the forms of money, the uh, historical articulation of money is not the same today as it was in, under the Bretton Woods system, that, that it was uh, under the gold standard and, and, and whatnot. And it's not the same uh, if you are doing policy in the US uh, or if you are doing policy in a developing country. And because of that, many of the things that MMT says, um, we also recognize that they can happen and, and they work like that in some uh, historical context for some countries. For example, Costas mentioned how the Fed was controlling interest rates and, and creating uh, money without leading to inflation and so on. So, so, but yeah, the point is that 
there is no straight line between our ontology of money and our uh, policy conclusions. The, the analysis is much more complex. Thank you both. Uh, so we have a couple of minutes left, but shall we try to do even the last, uh, the very last question <laughs> with very brief answers? So the last question is from Aspar, who says that the value of commodity money in Marx depends on uh, labor value embodied in the commodity. Is that right? If this is so, how does credit money relate to the labor theory of value? So I think, yeah, if you can do that in that, one minute, that, so that would that, be perfect. <laughs> <laughs> then you give me the Nobel Prize if I can do that <laughs> in one minute. Um, this is, of course, analytically and theoretically, this is a sixty-four thousand dollar question, right? Of course, if you if you also connect money to value theory, as you must, not just for Marxism but also for mainstream theory and so on, because of course, money and value are very very closely uh, related to each other. I mean, for the Marxist theory, it's a form of value. Money is a form of value. Um, so how does uh, one tackle that? I can tell you my view, which is based on years of working on this and on the basis of Marx and so on. Um, there, is a, there is a fundamental difference between commodity money and simple fiat money, simple symbols, representations of money that a state can create and credit money. There's a world of difference. Most money today is, of course, credit money, and that's the true capitalistic money, money created by banks, private, and all by the state. Credit money is fundamentally a promise to pay. It doesn't contain value, whereas commodity money does from the Marxist perspective. And that is a fundamental difference, but that's not the only difference, okay? Because as I indicated previously, the way they operate is very, very different. One is created in the credit way, the other is created through commodity interactions. Now, credit money, to come back to what you, the question is, doesn't contain value. It's a promise to pay. That's what makes it flexible, stretchy, right? And peculiar in its operations. It also makes it one or two or three stages detached from value, right? The determination of the value of credit money and its functioning in terms of accumulation is highly mediated by a number of institutions precisely because of this, okay? It doesn't contain value itself. And that, that's the last point I wanna make here, that it also gives content to the point I made previously. Credit money does not contain value. It's a promise to pay. It's a piece of paper or an electronic signal, right? Which acquires money and because of how people use it and because of the institutions. Therefore, whether a formal connection exists with something of value, produced of value or not, is of paramount importance. Whether convertibility exists into a produced commodity, necessary convertibility or not, is of paramount importance. It's a kind of anchor. Um, if that anchor doesn't exist, then the relationship of credit money to value production is mediated by institutions, the state, policy, and a lot of luck. And that's the kind of capitalism that we're living through. That's, that's what makes it, and that's what Keynes meant by managed money, the era of managed money. That's really basically uh, what is happening, and that's how we should understand it. Incidentally, MMT would do well to acquire this kind of theoretical understanding of it instead of going back 4,000 years. Great, that was two minutes. Very good. Good. on the short list for the Nobel Prize. Nico, we are out of time, but if you want to come in, I think it's fair to give you the no, chance, no, please. Fine. Thank you. Yeah, okay. So fantastic. Uh, this was a great lecture. Um, really nice uh, to see and listen to you both, uh, Nico and Costas. Uh, and thank you all for joining us. Um, so just uh, to remind you that this was the first lecture in uh, a mini series that we have organized uh, for the summer. And the next one is coming up on the 2nd of June uh, with Sophie Van Hulden and uh, Fuad Abubakar on uh, financialization of agri-food chains uh, looking at cocoa in Ghana, uh, always at uh, 5 p.m. UK time. Um, great to see you all and have a good evening. Lovely to see some of our current and former students as well, I must say. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Bye now. Bye-bye.